It's safe to say 1987's Dirty Dancing is perhaps one of the most iconic movies ever made. Besides being a surprise box office hit when it came out, with enduring popularity on home movie and now streaming, it's also a film that's been referenced, parodied, and adapted many, many times. From the short-lived 1988 television show to the popular stage version, you may or may not have heard of these adaptations. One that seems to have been erased in recent years is ABC's 2017 made-for-TV remake of the original, starring Abigail Breslin. If you're scratching your head saying, wait, there was a remake? Don't worry, you're not alone. Despite being watched by over 6 million people when it aired, this version has pretty much been completely forgotten since its release. And that's probably because, well, it's really bad. Like, really, really bad. I had the time of my life with you this summer. And it's also a musical, kind of. We'll get into it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Despite the fact that everyone seems to want to delete this awful attempt at a remake from their collective memory, there's actually a lot to talk about. Boy, is there a lot to talk about. You haven't touched me in almost a year. Besides a few shorter reviews that came out when it aired, there really hasn't been much in-depth discussion of this movie. So that's what we're gonna do today. Strap in, folks. If it's been a minute since you've seen the original Dirty Dancing, there's a chance you only remember the dance scenes. So let's go through a quick recap of the plot and characters before we dive in further. It's 1963 and Frances Baby Houseman arrives at Kellerman's, a Jewish resort in the Catskills with her family. Younger sister Lisa, mother Marjorie, and father Dr. Jay Houseman, who's a successful heart surgeon. The resort employees are made up of two different groups. The wait staff, who attend Ivy League schools and are encouraged to romance the daughters of guests, and the working class entertainment staff, including popular dance instructor Johnny Castle and his dance partner partner Penny. Baby is heading to college in the fall to study economics of underdeveloped nations and wishes to join the Peace Corps, while her sister Lisa is more interested in fashion and romancing their waiter, Robbie, who's headed to Yale Medical School in the fall. Baby is also being courted by the smug grandson of Kellerman's owner, Neil, but isn't very interested in him. One night, she's out walking and ends up at a secret dance party for the entertainment staff, where she's nervous at first, but eventually lets loose and dances with Johnny. Later, Baby finds dance partner Penny crying and discovers she's pregnant by waiter Robbie, who, despite being wealthy, will not help her pay for COVID for abortion. Baby asks her father for money instead, not telling him what it's really for. In order to get the procedure done, Penny would need to miss a performance at another resort and lose money for the whole season. Baby volunteers to learn the dance in her place, taking lessons with Johnny, tension between the two growing as they get closer. The dance goes well, even if they can't do the big lift, but when they get back to Kellerman's, Penny is injured from the botched procedure. Baby asks her father for help, angering him when he realizes where his money went and assuming that Johnny is the father. Upset, Baby seeks out Johnny and professes her feelings, then the two sleep together. Penny recovers. Baby and Johnny start to go out in secret, and Dr. Houseman grows distant from his daughter. When Neil shuts down Johnny's ideas for the final performance at the resort, Baby tells him he should stand up for himself, but continues to hide their relationship, disappointing Johnny. They reconcile, then Johnny gets into a fight with Robbie, who insults Penny and Baby. Feeling more confident from Baby's support, Johnny turns down the advances of housewife Vivian Pressman, who stays most days at the resort without her husband. Lisa wants to sleep with Robbie, but finds him together with Vivian. When Vivian sees Baby and Johnny together, she frames him for theft. Baby realizes he has an alibi as they were together when the theft occurred, but to reveal the truth would be to reveal their relationship to everyone. She comes clean and Johnny is cleared of the charges, but still gets fired for sleeping with a guest. Baby confronts Dr. Houseman, apologizing for lying but calling him out on his prejudiced view of Johnny. Johnny leaves the resort and parts with Baby on good terms. At the final performance, Dr. Houseman goes to give Robbie a recommendation for medical school and discovers that he's the one who actually got Penny pregnant. Johnny interrupts their performance and announces that he always says the final number. He brings Baby on stage and introduces her by her real name, Frances, telling everyone how she has changed him for the better. They perform the final dance, including the famous lift, and everyone at the resort joins in and dances together. The overarching plots of the original and the remake are mostly similar, but the changes make for two completely different viewing experiences. This starts right off the bat with the opening scene. While they both start with the same song, the remake uses a new, modernized cover. So I guess in an attempt to bring this film into the 21st century, even though it was already a period film when it came out in 1987. The original did have newer songs on the soundtrack, but the music still firmly set the film in the 1960s. In the remake, the updated songs are practically screaming to remind you that this is a new, modern version of the movie you already love. Not that old, stuffy version. And it only gets more jarring as the film progresses, and feels anachronistic more than anything. The second big change in this very first scene is that there is now an added framing device to the story. It no longer solely takes place in the summer of 
of 1963, but now starts and ends in 1975 with Baby going to see Dirty Dancing the Musical, harshly in front of this awful green screen, followed by a flashback to the main portion of the movie. Framing devices, aka a story within a story, can do a lot to a movie. They can add a different dimension to the characters or plot, show things through a different perspective, add layers that wouldn't otherwise be there, or even just add a bit of comedy. The important thing is that when they're used well, they actually add something to the movie. In this case, what the framing device adds is a uh, nothing? Literally nothing. Maybe some extra unnecessary voiceover. And don't worry, it only gets worse when it comes back in the end. The very first line of the remake, you never forget your first love, introduces us to by far the biggest problem with this movie, which is a complete lack of any subtlety or nuance. Baby saying you never forget your first love is telling us something that didn't need to be said out loud for the audience to understand it. There's a tendency from here on out for the characters to just outright state the themes of the movie with no irony at all. I was half expecting them to look into the camera and say, and now we're gonna do some dirty dancing at some point. After some awkward voiceover on boring footage of Baby smiling in a theater, we jump back to the same place the original film starts, the Hausman family in the car on the way to Kellerman's resort in the summer of 1963. Relating to this lack of subtlety problem is another major gripe, which is the movie's half-assed attempt to deal with social issues in the most blatant and often insulting ways, starting off with Baby not only reading the feminine mystique on screen, but openly discussing it with the other characters, including her sister Lisa. The feminine mystique. What does that mean? It's about how women's magazines portray housewives as happy and career girls as unhappy, when it's usually the opposite. If you don't know, The Feminine Mystique is a book by feminist writer Betty Friedan, criticizing the idea that a woman's ultimate fulfillment in life should come from being a housewife and mother. It came out in 1963, the year this movie takes place, and was hugely popular and influential in second wave feminism. The book was criticized from many sides, on the one hand by conservatives who believed it was attacking the American family, and on the other hand from activists who criticized its narrow focus on straight, white, middle-class housewives at the exclusion of other women, and it's still widely discussed today. This book could be a whole video on its own, and if you want a further discussion about motherhood in America, I recommend Cheyenne Lin's recent video on the topic. Despite the criticisms of the book, it does make sense for someone like Baby, an educated upper middle class woman, to be reading it. She is pretty much the target demographic, so I don't have a problem with its mere inclusion. In fact, the original movie has a great scene where a book is used to tell us more about a character. Some people count, some people don't. Read it. I think it's a book you'll enjoy, but make sure you return it. I have notes in the margin. The problem is that it's used as a shortcut to say Baby is a feminist while not actually engaging with feminist ideas in any coherent way. It even undercuts a lot of the feminist themes in the original movie with some of the changes to the story and characters. A lot of these issues come with what they did with Lisa's character. Now, of all the characters to change drastically, I think Lisa does make the most sense, as in the original, she's pretty much a walking stereotype. Ma, I should have brought those coral shoes. You said it was taking too much. Well, sweetheart, you brought 10 pairs. And it's understandable that they would want to update that for a newer version. However, it feels like they didn't actually know what they wanted to do with her. It seems like she's still supposed to be a narrative foil for Baby, but they wanted her to be likable. So this weird thing happens when they compare the two characters, it ends up making Baby unlikable instead. Lisa is now older than Baby and a college student. They do kind of make her ditzy like in the original. I have to throw out my magazines. But she's also much more opinionated. Her arguments with Baby, however, don't make her a more well-rounded character with her own beliefs. They just take on whatever the story needs her to think to contrast Baby in the moment. If Baby needs to look smart, Lisa says something stupid. If she needs to learn a lesson, Lisa is there to humble her. While the original Lisa was stereotypical, her actions were consistent with her character. She was still her own person. To finish out this awful voiceover, we have Baby telling us that this is The summer I stopped being the baby for good. Which is just awful dialogue. The nickname Baby is already so obvious, we really did not need it spelled out what it represents. Next, the family arrives at Kellerman's Resort, and the contrast between these two simple scenes is a great example of the differences between how these movies establish their plot and characters. What's it been, five years? Ten. Jake has been so busy with work. Well, even a world-famous heart surgeon deserves a rest. No doubt. Is this the baby? Mm. She's practically a woman. Baby's going to Mount Holyoke in the fall. She's the smart one. In the remake, we have all the characters directly stating facts in the most boring way possible. It's basically saying, hello, I'm a heart surgeon who works too much, and these are my daughters, the smart one and the pretty one. Lisa's jealousy is also strange here. She's also in college, and throughout the movie reiterates that her only interest is in finding a husband, but her jealousy seems to be of Baby's intelligence. You're one of those smart girls. Smart? She's gonna cure cancer. Rather than the close relationship that she has with her father like it is in the original. What you care about is that you're not daddy's girl anymore. He listens when I talk now. 
In the original, the dialogue is much more natural. So how's the blood pressure, Max? I want you girls to know if it were not for this man, I'd be standing here dead. And not only establishes the basic facts of these characters, but gives us a sense of their relationships and personalities as well. The remake also cut out the joke between Baby and Dr. Houseman. A tragedy is three men trapped in a mine or police dogs used in Birmingham. Monks burning themselves in protest. But out, baby. Instead, having Baby tell us that she worships her father. Show, don't tell is one of the most well-known rules of creative writing. The original film is showing us the Houseman family dynamic through their interactions, while the remake has to spell it out for us without ever actually letting the characters act on what they're saying. Even the background announcements are so much better in the original. In the remake, we have Neil droning on and on about popsicle flavors. Orange, <laughs> lemon, lime. Versus the original, the announcer stand makes a joke about Sandy Kofi. Softball on the East Diamond. All you Sandy Kopecks is get out there. Which not only sets the time period, but also establishes the environment of a Jewish Catskills resort in a single line better than any scene in the remake does. In the next scene showing dance lessons in the pavilion, we're introduced to a new character in the remake who is definitely one of the more likable additions in the pianist Marco. Unfortunately, this also gives us another example of the fumbling of social issues in the movie. Marco has some flirtatious eye contact with Lisa, and although she reciprocates, when Baby points out the connection, she says it can't happen. The first weird thing is that Baby seems genuinely confused by this. Get real, Baby. Why not? Like she's not aware that racism exists? I will remind you, this takes place in 1963, which is a full year before the Civil Rights Act was even passed, and six years before Loving v. Virginia, the Supreme Court case that legalized interracial marriage nationwide. I'm not sure if this is an acting or directing issue, because truly, Abigail Breslin looks confused for about half the movie. But either way, it comes off very odd. Then we get this line of dialogue. It's cute. So are puppies, but I'm not gonna date one. So kind of inadvertently comparing her black love interest to a dog, I just think that maybe they should have thought about that one a little bit more. So the scene where Baby overhears Kellerman talking to the wait staff about romancing the daughters at the resort, quote, even the dogs, is cut, and we go straight to dinner with the Houseman family instead. It really changes the dynamic of these characters. Originally, we as the audience and Baby know that the staff don't necessarily have the best intentions with the women they're pursuing. I shouldn't have to remind you, this is a family place. That means you Keep your fingers out of the water, your hair out of the soup, and show the goddamn daughters a good time. Lisa, who is younger and more naive, doesn't know this. It really sets up a comparison between Baby's relationship with Neil and Lisa's relationship with Robbie that doesn't exist in the remake. In fact, Baby in this version seems genuinely flattered at Neil's cringy compliments. That's fantastic. A woman can be anything she wants to be. I truly believe that. Thanks, Neil. It gives her so much less agency in the relationship. Instead of playing along to please her parents, now she's just being strung along by a man who sweet talks her by telling her he's also a fan of her favorite feminist book. Baby's reading a book you might like, The Feminine Mystique. I read it cover to cover. Betty Friedan is a revolutionary thinker. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Another important character change that flattens Baby's character is her ambitions after school. Baby in the original wants to join the Peace Corps and study economics of other developed nations. This is something that she's interested in all on her own. She's ambitious and passionate, but clueless about the problems in her own backyard. In the remake, Baby wants to be just like her father. Baby, you gonna be a doctor? Hopefully a surgeon like my dad. This adds nothing to the plot except for making one of her defining character traits come directly from a man. Even though she speaks more openly about feminism, she doesn't have any dreams of her own. Also, in making feminism her main issue, they try to do the same thing that they do with her views of other countries by making her criticism seem misplaced and naive. Except that they're not. Implying that a woman's criticism of the patriarchy in 1963 is misplaced is just absolutely ridiculous. But we'll get into the details of that subplot a little later. Our first dance scene between Penny and Johnny is now our introduction to the latter, which again goes into show don't tell. Instead of seeing how Johnny acts with the other staff, we just have Neil telling us that he has an attitude problem but guests love him before we know anything else about him. Literally all we've seen him do at this point is dance. Part of Penny and Johnny's personality is also flattened by the fact that in the original they're doing this incredible dance just because they want to, and Kellerman is specifically against it and cuts them off. Versus in the remake, they're asked to perform. Please welcome our very own dance team, Penny and Johnny. So the scene is just them doing their jobs and shows us nothing about them as characters other than that they can dance. It doesn't do anything to establish the conflict between the staff and Kellerman. This scene is also a really great example of just how ugly this movie is. It really does look made for television, which is not a compliment. The lighting is so orange, the camera work is a mess, and the costumes look cheap. Johnny's hair is giving middle school production of Guys and Dolls, and all of Baby's outfits are so unflattering. The audio is also terrible. I'm not sure if it's a lot of ADR or just bad mixing, but it does not sound good. I mean, 
I can dance like that. This scene also introduces us to possibly the most boring side plot in any movie I have ever watched in my life. That's not even a little bit of an exaggeration. This movie is 30 minutes longer than the original, and I'm pretty sure most of that time is spent on the fact that Mrs. Housepin, played by Deborah Messing, is unfulfilled in her marriage. Maybe we should sneak back to the room while the girls are occupied. The entire completely pointless storyline they added in for these adult characters is that they never bang anymore because the dad works too much. Besides the fact that, uh, no one cares and these actors have negative chemistry, it also takes away so much attention from what is, at its core, a coming-of-age story. The original was from Baby's perspective. It's about her journey into womanhood. Yes, it's a romance, but that is a vehicle for her growth and maturity. An old married couple who hate each other, complaining about how they never have sex anymore, does nothing to support those themes. And I would argue even takes away from the joyfulness and hope of young love. Truly the worst part of this movie, and that's saying a lot. So remember when I said this was a musical? Yeah, so we've arrived at that point. Now, some of the songs from the soundtrack, mostly the diegetic ones, are sung by the characters. If this is actually a musical, it's kind of questionable. <laughs> In this scene, for example, it's plausible that the characters could just be performing these songs for fun on their own, but it's also done in a way that doesn't really seem natural. They also keep a lot of non-diegetic music in the soundtrack, which is not something that's very common for musicals. I don't think the characters singing the songs adds anything to the movie, and in some cases when the actors are less vocally inclined, it even detracts from it. Our first song isn't a bad one. We have Marco singing Love Man, which was in the original movie, while Baby gets her first glimpse of some dirty dancing. He sounds great, definitely has one of the stronger voices in the film. But, on an emotional or character level, the singing does nothing. These songs weren't written for the film, they're just pop songs. And they're not even used in a way similar to a jukebox musical, where they're incorporated into the story. The characters just happen to be singing them. There's a lot of missed opportunities with Johnny in this scene. His entrance is completely irrelevant. He just walks in the door, unlike in the original where everyone is excited to see him. Original Johnny is well liked among all the entertainment staff. He's the life of the party and something of a ringleader. In the remake, he's just kind of there. I would argue Marco seems to be more of the leader of this group as well, which wouldn't necessarily necessarily be a bad thing if they gave him more to do and fleshed out his character a bit. But he is a very small role, and Johnny is supposed to be the male lead. So then they have Johnny come up to sing, and this is, uh, okay. He's not horrible. I don't think his voice is suited to any of the songs he sings, and it sounds way too modern, like he's trying to sing indie rock or something. <laughs> But it's not the worst singing you'll hear. However, we just heard Marco, who has a great voice, kill it. And then you have Nicole Scherzinger come in and belt her ass off with no effort. And you're like, oh. He sucks. Now, I will give credit where credit is due. First, after some more research, I found some more recent clips of Colt Prattis, who plays Johnny, singing in other roles, and he sounds a lot better. So to me, this is more of a miscast than a lack of talent. He's also an excellent dancer. You may recognize him from the Pink Try music video. And from a technical perspective, I have no problems. That being said, he does not have a fraction of Patrick Swayze's grace or charisma. Which brings us to another big problem with this movie, and that's the very fact that it is a remake. Remakes in our modern day are very easily ridiculed. Just go to the comment section of any trailer for a recent remake and you'll see what I'm saying. It's inevitable that you're going to get compared to the original. And while some remakes are able to do something creative enough to get past these criticisms, many are not. And in this case, we don't just have a very iconic movie being remade, we also have an iconic role played by a legendary actor who died tragically being remade. Literally the top comment on the YouTube video of this song is, this remake is an insult to Patrick Swayze's memory. No matter who they cast in this role, it would be impossible for them not to be compared negatively to someone as beloved as Patrick Swayze. And Colt Prattis doesn't even come close. Although he's a skilled dancer, his movements come across as so practiced and stiff, even in these scenes where he's supposed to be letting loose with his friends. This Johnny reads to me as a professional dancer who's trying to look like he's a regular blue-collar guy, whereas the original Johnny comes across as a regular guy who found a passion for dance. And this is really a testament to Swayze's acting, because that's not true for him at all. Patrick Swayze trained in ballet his entire childhood, and his mother was a professional dancer and choreographer, but watching him as Johnny, I believe he is the character in all ways. By making this a musical and having Johnny sing the song, they also remove this small moment that I love, where Johnny shakes his head and jumps in excitement when he hears the next song come on. I don't think that's something that would be impossible to portray with the character singing, but they do nothing to replace this or any of the other small human moments that makes these characters feel like real people, rather than dancing cardboard cutouts. The same thing happens at the end of the scene, where Baby has a second where she loses herself in the moment and does this sort of awkward happy dance. It's such a joyous, youthful instant where even though she's in a room full of people, Baby fully gives into herself because of the high that she got from dancing. If it was just these two moments on their own, it wouldn't ruin the movie, but they remove every single instance of anything genuine like that, leaving 
leaving the whole film feeling lifeless and stiff. Speaking of, the dialogue they wrote to replace one of the most iconic scenes in the entire movie is just so bad. Is that his girlfriend? Penny? Oh, that's just his dance party. God, it sounds so robotic. But to make matters worse, the famous line, I carried a watermelon, is completely botched. I carried his watermelon? What's your name? Baby. Do me a favor, baby. Tell your own watermelon next time. First of all, why does baby sound confused? <laughs> she seems like she's scared of Johnny here rather than awkward. Also, what does carry your own watermelon mean in this context? What is he even trying to say? Johnny's reaction is also very different. In the original, he comes off as concerned about having an outsider there, but when he sees baby's interest, he takes notice, relaxes, and dances with her. In this version, he just seems pissed off, but for some reason, still pulls baby into dance when she's trying to leave. They have zero chemistry to the point that I was glad when Penny interrupted them because they look so awkward together. Nicole Scherzinger as Penny is by far the best part of this movie. She's actually very good in this role. She steals pretty much every scene she's in and outsings everyone by a mile. Of course, we have to end the scene by being hit over the head with the meaning of the nickname Baby. You better change your name, kid, because you're not a baby anymore. Hey, do you get it yet? Do you get what the nickname Baby signifies? The next scene they added, which was not in the original, takes place at the staff breakfast. It somewhat replaces the conversation Baby overhears in the original. Those boys are all Ivy Leaguers. Any father here would be thrilled to see his daughter with any of them. Yeah, they seem like real sweethearts. I have dozens of resumes for other dancers, some of whom dance on Broadway. With Kellerman explaining the difference between the Ivy League wait staff and the lower class entertainment staff who he sees as replaceable. Now there's things I like and dislike about this scene. It's not placed well, and all the problems I mentioned before with Baby not knowing about the staff attitudes towards the daughters still exist. It also shows Johnny having a temper and being reactive towards Robbie. What'd you say? He just wants to rile you up. Don't let him. You're a real tough guy, Johnny. So why am I not impressed? Hey. Which I really dislike. I think this remake sees Johnny as a bad boy, but this is a total misread of his character. Kellerman, Neil, and some of the wait staff and guests see him this way because of his class, because of stereotypes. But we see through Baby getting to know him that he's actually a very sensitive and thoughtful person. And it makes it all that more surprising when he blows up on Robbie near the end of the movie. One thing I actually do like about this scene is how it shows the racial dynamics among the staff. This is actually a good example of show don't tell. No one has to ever come out and say anything about racism, but we have Johnny who is white almost getting into an altercation with Robbie, another white staff member, and Marco and Penny being the ones to try and defuse the situation in front of their boss. If you can't get along with my staff, say the word and I'll call them tomorrow. We won't be any trouble, Mr. Kellerman. Right, Johnny? As much as Kellerman sees Johnny as replaceable, you can feel that the consequences for him would be a little different if he were to lose his job or get in a fight than they might be for Marco or Penny. The scene after this is also added in, and it's barely even worth mentioning. Baby and her dad are golfing, and he asks her if she really wants to be a doctor or if she's only doing it to please him. You want to be a doctor, don't you? You're not doing it for me, right? I mean, of course. It's not pure coincidence that I chose medicine. And we are once again reminded that she doesn't have any ambitions of her own and apparently only wants to please the men in her life, so that's great. So the scene where Baby tries on wigs is pretty similar to the original, but the small things that they do change take away a lot. First, the wig itself is played completely straight. The scene ends with Penny telling Baby to buy this ugly-ass old lady wig that's apparently supposed to be a Marilyn Monroe look. You should buy that wig. It's honestly bizarre, but there's a few little dialogue changes that really screw things up. Penny no longer says that she was kicked out by her mother at 16. Now, she just hasn't spoken to her parents in a few years. It softens her backstory for no reason. They also take out Baby saying, I envy you. which is so frustrating. That was such a simple but effective line. Just three words, but it shows how Baby is naive, how she glamorizes this beautiful, talented older woman because of what she sees on the outside, while not recognizing the everyday struggles that she goes through. Without that line, and without learning more of Penny's personal struggles, this scene is really only there to show Abigail Breslin in an ugly wig. They also screw up something huge for later in the film by revealing Baby's name, Francis, in this unimportant scene. What's your name? <laughs> Francis. Thank you. But everyone calls me baby. In the original, the reveal of her name to Johnny is a very pivotal moment, but saying it so casually here makes it meaningless. We have more boring sexless marriage stuff next. Remember our honeymoon? Walking down the Champs Elysees, drinking Van Crosset at the bistro next to the hotel? and then Penny's pregnancy reveal, shown with the movie cliche of her throwing up in the bushes before outright telling Baby, who she barely knows, that she's pregnant. You can't work, you're sick. I'm not sick. I'm pregnant. 
Now, this is super important for the plot, dare I say the inciting incident, but it's quickly overshadowed with probably the most baffling musical number in the whole thing. Vivian Pressman, an older woman who stays at Kellerman's alone, performs a sultry rendition of the song Fever with Johnny in front of the whole resort. In the original, it's implied that they're sleeping together, but in this version, it's shown on screen. So they have dance lessons, but apparently they actually do have real dance lessons where they choreograph this. I have a lot of questions, number one being, why? I have a lot of questions. Number one, how dare you? Also, if they're allowed to perform like this on a random night in front of everyone, why do they have a talent show at the end of the summer? And why is the dancing Johnny and Penny do so scandalous? The dad literally calls this vulgar. In the morning. This is vulgar, let's go. And also the mom is just so beyond horny for it, it's really uncomfortable to watch. Finally, we get back to the actual plot of this thing where Baby goes to tell Johnny about the pregnancy. This is another instance where I was practically screaming show don't tell at the screen. The original has very minimal dialogue, most of what's happening conveyed by the expressions on the actors' faces as they whisper to each other. When they do start talking audibly again, it picks up in the middle of the action with very snappy dialogue that explains the situation and how the characters fit in it in just a few sentences. What's wrong? What's the matter with her? She's knocked up, baby. Billy. In the remake, we have the characters standing around looking constipated, and Baby is almost entirely removed from the situation. She's just a bystander. Originally, she automatically assumes Johnny must be the father. What's he gonna do about it? What's he gonna do about it? Oh, it's mine, right? Right away you think it's mine. But I thought the and further assumes Robbie will just pay for the abortion once she's corrected. Not because she's stupid, but because she's naive. Seeing this happen, how it affects Penny, and how she and Johnny are treated because of it is what opens her eyes to the realities of the world around her. In the remake, she's very passive, just standing there awkwardly as Penny and Johnny discuss things among themselves. Penny is also made a lot more passive. Originally, she goes through a full range of emotions. Her obvious fear as Johnny comforts her, her resentment towards Baby and her privilege. You don't know shit about my problems. Now she's just like kinda sad. After this, we have one of the most infuriating sequences in the whole film. It starts with Lisa going to sneak off in the middle of the night and Baby admonishing her for only being interested in marriage. Then Lisa shouting back at her. Why can't I just get married without you judging me? Baby having no response. Now, if this was just the beginning of their conflict and things got more complex as the story went on, I'd probably be okay with it. But the thing is, they don't. Every time this conflict between Lisa and Baby comes up, it's framed as Baby being wrong for judging Lisa rather than any actual feminist objection to marriage. It comes across as a very 21st century brand of choice feminism, wherein any choice a woman makes is feminist and empowering because she makes it. I'm not a big fan of this type of so-called feminism in general, but it's especially ridiculous to apply to a movie set in the 1960s. This was before birth control was legal, before no-fault divorce, and very important to this particular story, before Roe v. Wade was passed. To frame getting married as a free choice that women could equally make with minimal effects on their lives is laughable. It's also one of the biggest criticisms of the feminine mystique. The choice for most women was not high paying fulfilling career or housewife. Many women had to work low paying jobs out of necessity, often while still raising a family, and many didn't have an opportunity for a job or advanced education at all. I'm not saying these things have gone away, but it's certainly way more pronounced in the 1960s. The storyline with Lisa and Robbie is probably my least favorite part of the original film. Lisa is kind of made the butt of the joke when Robbie tries to pressure her off screen. I don't hear an apology. Go back to mommy and daddy and keep listening, Lisa. Maybe you'll hear one in your dreams. I'm sorry I had to see that baby. And the fact that she still pursues him afterwards bothers me. The remake, despite attempting to update Lisa's character, does not do any better. When she sneaks out to see Robbie, instead of Baby witnessing the aftermath of their encounter, we now have an attempted essay fully on screen, which I am not going to show here. I question why we need to display violence against women like this when it's barely even a part of the plot beyond this point. Robbie in the original still came off as an absolute asshole and creep without ever having to show any of the women getting assaulted by him. Robbie, of course, victim blames Lisa, saying if she tells Kellerman, he'll say, she seduced him. I'm gonna go to Mr. Kellerman and tell, tell him. him what? You came after me, remember? You brought the wine. This could be an interesting thread to follow, how he holds his power over the women at Kellerman's like this. But the narrative seems to almost back up his reasoning by shaming any of the young women who show sexual desire. We'll see this later with how Baby's interest in Johnny and Penny's abortion are talked about. Lisa, in the original, was not solely interested in marrying Robbie. She wanted to have sex with him, and while she was shown as naive for not seeing through his charming facade, she wasn't shamed for being interested in someone sexually. Remake Lisa is portrayed as more of an innocent, good girl, and it's very frustrating. Robbie's actions aren't wrong because 
Lisa is pure. They're wrong, period. In the next scene, we very briefly have Lisa trying to speak up against Robbie while her father defends him and talks about golf. Robbie, you play golf? Yes, sir. My father always says he made more deals on the golf course than in the boardroom. <laughs> she states some of the obvious themes of the movie. Why do you people think that just because a guy goes to Harvard or Yale, that means he's perfect? I mean, maybe he's an axe murderer. And we don't even get the catharsis of baby pouring water on him. You make me sick. Stay away from me. Stay away from my sister. Or I'll have you fired. Instead, we have the mom making fun of her for... You're saying our waiter's an axe murderer? No, I don't know, but he could be. We would never know. She's right, Jake. We would never know. Being stupid, I guess, after she was literally assaulted. And that's the end of the Lisa and Robbie story before her plot shifts to focusing on an entirely different man. Great job at feminism, guys. After Baby asks her dad for money to pay for the abortion, which is a very similar scene in both movies, we get a very pointless change, which is that there is no longer an actual reason for Baby to be taking dance lessons with Johnny. In the original, Penny could only get an appointment on the same day as her and Johnny's performance at the Sheldrake, another resort. And if she missed it, she would not only lose the money from that job, but the entire next summer salary as well. This is a perfect complication to add in the plot. It both creates a reason for Baby to learn to dance and get closer to Johnny, as well as demonstrates Penny's circumstances and how they contrast with Baby's. Now, Baby insists on taking dance lessons because Johnny's just too stubborn or proud, I guess, to take the money. You don't have to pay it back. That's even worse. We're not a charity case. Yes. We are, Johnny. This just makes him come off as an asshole. Like, buddy, you're not the one who's pregnant. Baby has some extremely unconvincing dialogue about why she wants to learn to dance. Because it's good for the human brain to learn new things. Keeps you from getting senile and we move on to their lessons. So there's a glaring difference between the two versions of this dance lesson scene. The original, we start in the middle of the lesson, where you can see that they've been trying for a while and Baby is having trouble with the steps. Oh, no. sorry. Oh, sorry. You don't step on the one, you idiot. You gotta start on the two. Find the two, you understand? I told you I never did any of these dances before. In the remake, we start from the very beginning, and Johnny is a shit teacher and already angry despite not really explaining anything and kind of just counting at baby. Six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. Two, three, four. You don't step on the one, you gotta start on the two. Two, three, four. Find the two, you understand? Two, three. No. Can you count? There's a lot of these little changes that make Johnny come off as a jerk. Rather than being frustrated with his situation and tired of how he's treated, he's just constantly pissed off for no reason. It makes him very unlikable. And God, they have no chemistry. I'd rather watch either of them dance with a broom. This scene is also supposed to be a montage, but they spend way too much time in the same spot doing the same thing. They even come back to the original dance lesson after they show progress, unless they just happen to be wearing the same exact outfits on two different days. Either way, it's confusing and not usually how this type of montage works. And now that Baby has no real reason to learn to dance, the stakes are completely removed, and I have no interest in watching this. It's just some bored looking people stepping two, three, four, over and over and over. This scene also really highlights how much Abigail Breslin cannot dance. I know her most famous role had a big dance number, but she was nine years old then. I genuinely do not understand her casting here. Compare Jennifer Grey's dancing when she's finally figured out the steps to hers. It's silly and over the top, but she looks so much more natural and fluid. Then we get another boring family meal scene, interrupted by Neil, where Baby literally comes out and says, I'm not like other girls. Lisa's the one who likes dancing and boys and lipstick. And I'm the other one, the one who likes books and art and dissecting fetal goats. And then we have Neil mansplaining the feminine mystique to Baby, except it's played completely straight. Like he's actually teaching her something. You should be able to take a merengue class or wear lipstick without it leading to the end of Western civilization. <laughs> Isn't that what the feminine mystique is all about? That women shouldn't have to choose between a career and a personal life? You're absolutely right, Neil. Why is she impressed by this? Ugh, I hate him. Next, the Sheldrake performance finally comes into the plot. You know, when Baby's already taken a bunch of dance lessons and has visibly improved and happens to be learning the exact type of dance they do for their routine and is standing right there listening to Penny and Johnny talk about how no one else can fill in, making it extremely obvious that she'll do it. There's gotta be somebody. What about her? 
Again, there's no stakes here. It's just a happy coincidence that Baby can do it at this point. The Hungry Eyes montage is one of the most famous parts of the original. It's super memorable, showing the growing sexual tension between Baby and Johnny as her dancing improves and they start getting along better. It may be considered cheesy by some, but it works. The chemistry between the actors, the tight clothing, the choreography all come together to make it romantic and passionate in a way that drives the plot and their connection forward. There's a lot of subtle moments that work really well too, like the cut between their practice shoes and the performance shoes to show their progress. The remake, of course, does none of this. First, although the casual dance clothes they put Baby in are a lot more flattering than the ugly button downs and cardigans they keep putting her in, they decide to put Johnny in this ugly ass baggy t-shirt with the sleeves cut off that is so unflattering. We also have the same problem as the first dance training sequence. It's technically a montage, but it's all the same two dance lessons with their lack of chemistry and the ugly brown background. It's just boring to watch. There's nothing visually interesting here. No awkward moments or mess ups or anything that seems candid. They're just going through the whole dance in broken up pieces. When we go to practice the lift in the river, it's the most boring interpretation I can imagine of something that should be so inherently romantic and sexy. In the original, we have Baby and Johnny escaping in the rain after tension between them is at an all-time high. Johnny brashly breaks his own car window to get his keys so they can get away, showing off his impulsivity in the moment. The car ride to the river, we have Baby and Johnny laughing and letting loose after being cooped up all day in the rain. Then we get another famous scene where they practice on a log over the river, then in the lake. It's pretty simple. Two beautiful people in a beautiful setting having fun. It's playful, it's sexy, even learn a little bit about Johnny's backstory of how he learned to dance. Dr. Murray was given a test for instructors, so if you passed, they teach you all these different kinds of dances, show you how to break them down, how to teach them, you know? Swayze is just oozing with charm the entire time. You cannot keep your eyes off of him. And by the end of the scene, you want nothing more than for the two of them to kiss. The remake skips all the buildup, jumping into the river scene after a commercial break. There's no tension, there's no chemistry. We don't learn anything about either of these characters. The music, both the modern cover version of Hey Baby and the score are so heavy handed it honestly distracts from the movie. <laughs> I feel like I'm watching a music video. They only put the scene here because it was in the original without understanding why it works so well in the first place. When they actually do the lift in the water, the sun is setting, which should be really beautiful to look at, but because of the reflection, we can't even see their faces. I really don't care at this point if they get together or not. If possible, we cut to an even less sexy scene where Marjorie Houseman attempts to seduce her husband by putting on a nightgown while the husband complains he's too tired from golfing. I just spent four hours golfing with that <laughs> orthodontist from Newton Leon. Feinberg, he talked nonstop to throw me off my game, and it worked. You haven't touched me in almost a year. I wouldn't even mention the scene if it wasn't for the absolute baffling fact that Marjorie says she pushed Dr. Hausman to come back to the resort for the sole purpose of getting him to have sex with her again. Why do you think I pushed you to come back here? I was hoping that maybe this place would remind you the last time that we were here, you couldn't keep your hands off me. Girl. You took your husband to a family resort with your two daughters to seduce him? Why did you think that would work? They're both in college. Go on a vacation yourselves. Next, we have this weird scene between Marjorie and Vivian Pressman, who in this version is now divorced. Oh, well, it's just me. We're divorced. Besides this scene being very, very boring, it also attempts to do some characterization for these women that just doesn't make sense. It seems like they want us to be more sympathetic to Vivian by giving her more of a backstory, making her a lonely divorcee instead of a lonely housewife. But is this really so much better just because she's not cheating? Her husband in the original clearly does not care what she does with the staff. The problem is how she treats Johnny, how she looks down on him and thinks she can use him and throw him away just because she has money. That's still bad even if she's divorced now. And we have Marjorie saying that she married for love and her husband was a waiter at Kellerman's. I actually married for love. So did I. My husband was a waiter here. No kidding. Missing the whole huge plot point that the waiters are all students on their way to Harvard and Yale were encouraged to romance the daughters. Maybe she did truly marry for love, but Dr. Hausman was not some struggling waiter like they framed this. He was a med school student. The point of this whole exchange was to plant the idea of divorce in Marjorie's head, but they couldn't have done that in any other way. We really didn't need to know more about Vivian Pressman. I would have been way more interested if the end point in this storyline was that these two started an affair instead. Screw the boring husband. The scenes between Vivian and Johnny are also super uncomfortable. We continue with this scene that she's actually lonely 
only, and that's why she's pursuing Johnny this way. But she's still throwing money or expensive jewelry at him and expecting him to do what she says, just like Johnny talks about in the original movie. But it's framed like we're supposed to feel bad for her now, with the camera lingering on her sad face after Johnny leaves. This isn't about her, and it doesn't really make me feel bad for her at all. Now, we do get a scene that I actually enjoyed, a dance lesson between Penny and Baby. Honestly, the scene is pretty pointless after endless dance montages that go nowhere, but at least it's fun now. Both these actresses look great in these outfits. I actually love the way that they styled Baby's hair for the scene. It does make her look more mature, and they're clearly having fun dancing together. While Nicole very obviously out-sings and out-dances Abigail Breslin, <laughs> They both have enough energy that it's enjoyable to watch. Nicole's talent and charisma uplifts her scene partner here rather than outshining her. Well, I should come on over, baby. A whole lot of shaking going on. This is one of the actual musical numbers in the film, where they sing for no diegetic reason. I'd say it doesn't add anything to the movie, but it was way more fun to watch than all the boring montages, so I'll give it a pass. And the fact that this cuts directly to Penny helping Baby get into her performance dress, like Johnny who? <laughs> the dress they put her in is also so damn ugly. It looks like a high school homecoming dress from like 2012, or maybe a bad dance recital costume. With the sequins, the layers, the bright turquoise, Baby looked out of place in the original dress because she hadn't fully embraced her sexuality yet. She's still finding herself and isn't comfortable in the more adult clothing. But this version of Baby is just given awful costumes again and again. Next, we're introduced to our second new plot a whole hour into this movie, which is Lisa's flirtation with Marco, which was hinted at a little bit in the beginning. She finds him practicing guitar and singing, and he offers to give her ukulele lessons. I don't think so. I have small fingers. I have just a thing. Perfect for small fingers. This is way more entertaining than the god-awful, unfulfilled wife plot with the boring parents. And honestly, if they really wanted to go for this, I think they could have just cut out everything between Robbie and Lisa and given these two more time instead. The scene is pretty short before Billy Dee Williams comes in to remind them about racism. Leave the little white girls alone. I think this would have been an interesting storyline to delve into, possibly to compare how their relationship would be treated versus Baby and Johnny's. And these actors have pretty good chemistry, but it's not given enough space. It's also never acknowledged that the history of these Jewish resorts was one born directly out of discrimination, when many resorts outright banned Jewish Americans in the early 20th century. I feel like if they wanted to talk more directly about race, it would have been a good opportunity to address those themes and that side of the changing social climate of the time. Lisa and Marco only have a few scenes together, and it seems like an afterthought compared to the drawn-out storyline about the parents' marriage that no one gives a shit about. One good thing, so many scenes in this movie start and end with characters walking in and out of rooms, rather than starting with the action, and it really makes things very slow. This scene, however, ends on Marco sadly playing a chord on the ukulele, which did make me laugh. Their mambo dance at the Sheldrake isn't horrible. I still don't think Abigail Breslin is a very good dancer, but this is probably the best number they do together, which is disappointing considering there's a way more famous and important dance still to come. The car ride back to Kellerman's is one of the better scenes between Baby and Johnny. It's actually kind of flirtatious and they both seem to be having fun, which is rare because most of the movie they look miserable. The scene where they get back to Kellerman's to find Penny injured from the abortion is a perfect example of how the remake changes just enough things to undermine the point of the original. Nothing dramatic about the plot is changed. Penny gets back from the so-called doctor right in pain, Johnny goes to comfort her, Baby finds her father, a surgeon, to help, and he blames Johnny for what happens. On the surface, it would seem like these two are telling the same story, but when you actually watch the two scenes, they portray the characters and themes completely differently. Instead of Billy explaining what happened at the back alley clinic, I thought you said he was at real MD. <laughs> the guy had a dirty knife and a folding table. The commercial break cuts straight to Baby waking up her father to help. Johnny! 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 Hurry! Penny! This removes some vital information, including the reason that Penny didn't want to call an ambulance. You didn't call an ambulance? She said the hospital would call the police. She made me promise. It also takes away a lot of the tension and urgency in the situation. This movie is told through Baby's perspective. We see her reactions to what's happening to Penny, her moment of realization that motivates her to ask her father for help. But with that moment taken out, she once again becomes more of a bystander than the main character. When Dr. Houseman arrives, instead of asking who's responsible for Penny and Johnny stepping up willingly, Who's responsible for this girl? I am. Please, uh, is she... He just assumed Johnny must have gotten her pregnant. I assume you're responsible for this girl. Yes. 
You should be ashamed of yourself. It's another moment that takes away the character's agency. While Dr. Houseman's judgment of Johnny as irresponsible is ultimately the same, Johnny's characterization is not. Originally, he steps up because he cares about Penny, willing to face the judgment because he knows he's doing the right thing. In the remake, he doesn't make a choice at all. They almost try to remedy this in the next part by having him say this. I don't care what he thinks of me as long as he takes care of Penny. But it happens because Baby is upset that he stood up for Penny. Why did you do that? In her conversation with her father, Baby comes off as completely spineless. She literally says, yes, daddy, when he tells her not to associate with the entertainment staff anymore. You're not to associate with him again. Yes, dad. Dr. Houseman's reaction is also very different and makes him so much less likable. He is just dripping with contempt for the staff. Not that it matters to you, but here's what I think of that guy. He's not good enough to wash my car. He's absolutely furious at Baby, putting a strong focus on how the abortion was illegal rather than how Penny was hurt. Just let me explain. Did you know it was illegal and that by helping her you could go to jail? Use your brain, baby. In the original, he is definitely prejudiced and makes assumptions about Johnny and Penny that are unfounded, but you can see that his reaction towards Baby is mostly based on fear and his refusal to accept that his daughter is becoming a woman. You're not the person I thought you were, baby. I'm not sure who you are. But I don't want you to have anything to do with those people again. And of course, to end the scene, we have example 8 million of stating the themes out loud. And stop calling me baby. I'm 18 years old. Compare this to the much more subtle line from the original and baby's reaction to it. And take that stuff off your face before your mother sees you. The remake is screaming at you to tell you that Baby is an adult now without actually showing any kind of growth to reflect this, while the original never has to come out and tell you this for it to be abundantly clear what the conflict between Baby and her father is. Now we move on to Baby and Johnny finally sleeping together. This is a very pivotal moment in the movie, really a culmination of everything that's been building up between them and the moment that Baby, at least in a narrative sense, becomes a woman. After seeing what happened with Penny, she's truly opened her eyes to the world around her, and she finally has the confidence not only to stand by her convictions in her real life, but also to act on her desires. It's a beautiful scene, sensual, intimate, and the conversation leading up to it is key for both of these characters. Johnny's line, I mean, the reason people treat me like I'm nothing is because I'm nothing cuts to his deepest insecurities. He judges himself based on how other people see him. He doesn't think he'll ever do anything worthwhile and sees someone like Dr. Houseman as a real hero. Baby, on the other hand, realizes how sheltered she's been and doesn't think she can handle the real world. I'm scared of everything. I'm scared of what I saw. I'm scared of what I did, of who I am. And most of all, I'm scared of walking out of this room and never feeling the rest of my whole life the way I feel when I'm with you. But the beauty of it is they both see through each other's insecurities and recognize their strengths. Baby admires Johnny's integrity in standing up for Penny no matter what, and Johnny admires Baby's bravery in asking her father for help even though she knew she could get in trouble. It may be my favorite scene in the whole movie, bolstered by amazing performances from Patrick Swayze and Jennifer Grey. And this is what they replace it with. What am I gonna look back on? Dancing. I'm sorry, it's so cringe. They're kind of trying to make this about Johnny's insecurities, but they're being so literal about the dancing. It's baffling. Again, with the subtlety problem. Instead of Johnny's insecurities coming from his precarious financial situation and how he's treated by wealthy people, we give him a whole confusing backstory that adds nothing. Every time I look at a book, the letters start swimming around on the page. So I dropped out of school, hung around my cousin's garage. And he and his buddies taught me how to hotwire cars and sell them off in parts. It's a great gig until I got caught. Now, he apparently dropped out of high school because he was dyslexic and turned to crime because of it and then went to jail. He turned to dancing because he wasn't good at anything else, not because he was passionate about it or anything like that. It was just a last resort, which is just, what? I wouldn't necessarily be against this backstory if they did anything interesting with it, but of course, the dyslexia doesn't come back at all, and the criminal history only gets brought up at the end when Neil accuses him of stealing, which is another example of undercutting the point. Johnny is accused in the original because of prejudice. That point isn't as strong when he actually has a criminal history of theft. The original scene is so passionate and simmering with tension. When she asks him to dance with her, they are seconds away from jumping each other's bones. In the remake, Johnny seems like he actually hates Baby. Not that he's pushing her away because he's insecure, he straight up does not like her. Are you trying to scam me away? Yes. You ace the final exam, just like you ace everything. Congratulations. Now please, get out of my life. It's honestly uncomfortable, and we have like 30 seconds of awkward silence of Baby just staying there nodding to herself.
I will give it to them that their dancing in this scene does have better chemistry than the rest of the movie, but it isn't earned at all. I still don't believe they even like each other. It's also really ugly. The lighting is so dark and orange again, and the music is just too loud. Don't you feel like crying? Don't you feel like crying? I think the fact that it no longer sounds like it's being played from an actual record takes away from a lot of the passion and spontaneity of the original. When we get to Dr. Houseman checking in on Penny, this scene legitimately made me angry. He calls Penny's botched abortion a wake-up call. Any medical scare is a wake-up call and tells her that she should take stock of her life and maybe make some changes. This is not only completely unnecessary, but it's after school special levels of moralizing. Things stuck. Do the best. The soft music and Penny's response of saying thank you make it clear that we're supposed to agree with Dr. Houseman here. There is nothing to push back on what he's saying, essentially blaming Penny for what happened to her. The original movie celebrates female sexuality. It never shames Penny for her situation, and it makes it clear that if her circumstances were different, if she didn't have to worry about money or keeping her job, if there was a safer alternative for her, this would not be happening. I know this remake came out in 2017, but watching it now, it feels pretty disgusting and preachy to have a character who was a white male doctor telling a woman of color it's her fault that she only almost died due to a botched abortion. When Johnny comes in to talk to her, he makes it all about himself. So that's me, huh? Big regret? Leave it alone, Johnny. And they try to frame it like Dr. Houseman was saying the wake-up call was about Johnny being a bad guy, but that's still a judgment on Penny for supposedly sleeping with the wrong person. When Baby comes to visit Penny, she quickly catches on to her and Johnny's relationship and warns him to put an end to it. This is very similar in both movies. What are you doing? How many times have you told me not to get mixed up with them? What are you doing? Don't worry about Max. I'll tell him your grandmother died or something. How many times do you tell me never get mixed up with them? But Johnny's reaction is very different. In the original, he's conflicted over what to do and tells Baby he has to leave for work. But they end it smiling at each other, seemingly hopeful for their future. In the remake, he's just angry, so resentful of Baby's privilege. Can we talk later? I have to work. I'm not on vacation like you. I actually work here. They haven't worked anything out, and I still don't believe they like each other. After that, we're right on back to our divorce storyline, with Marjorie deciding to sing a very boring song to convince Dr. Houseman to stay for the rest of the weekend. He starts tearing up while her face is just absolutely blank, singing to a bunch of resort guests who definitely don't want to be hearing this. Baby sneaks away to go yell at Johnny and beg for him to take her back, and it honestly comes off as pathetic. It very much has I can fix him energy. You know, you may act like you're this too cool for school jackass, but you don't fool me. Because I know you, and I know that this thing meant something. The original Johnny wasn't a jackass at all, but this version wants us to believe that he's really sweet deep down, guys. Well, not showing that. Their relationship is so unappealing. He comes out and kisses her, which obviously fixes everything. Then we're back to our new storylines. More boring divorce stuff. What, are you asking for a divorce? Yes. Seriously, if I wanted to see two wealthy people divorcing, I'd watch a marriage story. Lisa overhears them arguing and goes to find Marco, who she's been taking more ukulele lessons from off screen. They hint at the fact that they've grown closer, but they get so little screen time we don't actually see it happening. I would much rather watch their interactions than the parents. He comforts her when she's upset about the divorce, and it's pretty sweet. Uh, come on. Uh, I'll walk you back to your cabin. <laughs> Just because it's dark. And then I'll leave. I'm a gentleman. I know. When we finally get back to our main characters, they're in bed together, and once again, their issues have not been resolved. Baby wonders why Johnny isn't on Broadway, which is so naive, and Johnny still makes a quip about her perfect life and how easy things are for her. You should be on Broadway. Yeah, right. Why not? Because it would never work out. How do you know? It's easy for you to say. Your life's one big happy ever after. So nothing has changed. We're an hour and a half into the movie. We should be beyond this. Then Vivian interrupts them by banging on Johnny's door and trying to get his attention. Johnny, I know you're in there. I heard voices. I want another rat bastard in my life. I'll I'll get another husband. In the original, the conversation about the women at the resort taking advantage of him comes up much more organically. The monologue Johnny gives explaining how he feels about it is really important to his character and to the class themes of the movie. He talks about feeling used by the wealthy women who throw their money around to manipulate him. And they're so rich, they're so goddamn rich, you think they must know about everything. And they're slipping the room keys in my hands two and three times a day, different women. And so here I think I'm scoring big, right? And for a while you think, hey, they wouldn't be doing this they didn't care about me, right? They don't really see him as a person. 
In the remake, Johnny doesn't seem to really have a problem with how he's treated. He's more just annoyed at Vivian than anything else. Do tell. She means nothing to me. <laughs> Seriously, she's a bungalow bunny. And of course, because it was already revealed at the beginning of the movie, we no longer get Baby revealing her name, Francis, to Johnny in bed. What's your real name, Baby? Francis. You're the first woman in the cabinet. <laughs> Francis, that's a, that's a real grown-up name. This represented her becoming a woman and the intimacy and trust she has with Johnny. But now it's just not important. And why would it be important when Baby and everyone else around her has been explicitly stating that she's an adult since the beginning of the movie? The next scene between Baby and Lisa is all over the place. It starts off with them lamenting over their parents' divorce, which, whatever, I do not care at this point at all. Then Lisa notices Baby's obviously just got banged look, and we actually get a very cute moment between them. Did you... Did you sleep with someone? <laughs> Yet. This is quickly dashed when Lisa realizes who Baby actually slept with. Lisa questions why she would give herself to a guy like Johnny, and Baby says this. I don't understand. I... I love him. I really hate this. They're making Baby justify sleeping with Johnny because he's her true love. This continues to be the case for the rest of the movie, but it's completely missing the point. Baby in the original slept with Johnny because she felt ready and she wanted to have sex with him, plain and simple. While yes, I do think that they feel love for each other. It's just wrong this way. It should be with someone. It should be with someone that, that you sort of love. There's never this expectation that this is her soulmate or anything. That it's only okay because she truly loved him. So much of the original focused on Baby's desire, how she realizes that and becomes comfortable with it. But the remake feels the need to justify women having desire by cushioning it with the language of true love, which is a very old fashioned and not very feminist take. When we get to the famous lover boy scene, a lot of it is pretty similar, except now it's a musical number. Like all the other instances of singing in this movie, both diegetic and non-diegetic, it adds nothing to the plot. We're just hearing two mediocre singers butchering a well-known song from the original. I will give them credit that Baby does look a lot more mature in these dance clothes. I think this is a very flattering outfit for her, and she seems a lot more confident than she has in other scenes between her and Johnny. In this version, Neil sees them in the act, and we immediately cut to Kellerman raiding Johnny's room at the suggestion that he stole from a guest. This cuts out a great character moment for Johnny when he tries to pitch his ideas for the more modern choreography for the final dance number. I've been working with the staff kids on, on, the, on this like cross between this Cuban rhythm and, and the soul dance. It like goes, whoa, 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 boy. Uh, it's way over your head here. Now, I thought you always do the mambo. Huh? And why not dance this year's final dance to the pachanga? We really get to see his passion for dance and how devastated he is when Neil shuts him down. It also shows the classic tension between an artist's vision and the pressure from financiers, even if it's on a very small scale at a vacation resort. Johnny is beholden to whatever the camp directors, who don't know anything about dance, want him to do. Well, you're free to do the same tired numbers last year if you want, but uh, next year we'll find another dance person who'll be only too happy. Sure, Neil. No problem. Of course, our modern too cool for school Johnny doesn't actually like to dance and does it because it's apparently the only thing he's good at. So this scene wouldn't even make sense in this version. From here on out, the movies are pretty different. Up to now, the scenes were mostly one-to-one -one with the addition of the divorce storyline and Lisa's relationship with Marco. But now we go in a completely different direction with Baby and Johnny as well. Johnny actually gets arrested for stealing a watch. Then we skip over Baby hiding her relationship from her family and Johnny's fight with Robbie. The Robbie thing makes sense because he's barely been in this movie since Lisa got rid of him, but Baby hiding from her family is a really big missed opportunity. In the next scene, when Baby does speak out and tell the truth about where Johnny was the night before, giving him an alibi for the theft, it's meaningful to the both of them. Nobody has ever done anything like that for me before. And shows Baby's growth and integrity. Now, that conflict isn't really there since Baby was barely hiding in the first place and Lisa already knew she slept with Johnny. We also no longer get Johnny directly turning down Vivian, which is a big moment that shows how his relationship with Baby has given him the confidence to stand up for himself. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Pressman, but I'm booked up the whole weekend, you know, to show on everything, so I won't have time for anything else. And I don't think it'd be fair to take the money. He no longer feels beneath these people just because they're rich, and their manipulation doesn't work anymore. In the remake, he just kind of ignores her. Vivian Pressman came by last night, pounding on the door. She was angry and jealous. 
She obviously wanted to punish him. And she frames him because she's an evil, vindictive woman, I guess. Another win for feminism. Also, the dialogue when Baby admits to being with Johnny all night is so awkward and redundant. He was in his room all night. He was with me all night. He never left his room. Oh, right. The poison. The poison for Cusco. The poison chosen specially to kill Cusco. Cusco's poison. After that, we get a scene of Dr. Houseman playing piano and singing because, uh, this is a musical, I guess? This scene really reiterates that he is the most miserable man on the planet. You should buy a piano for the house. Not interested. The argument between Baby and her father, which in the original is the moment when Baby confronts him and he finally recognizes his own prejudice and accepts that his daughter is a woman now, becomes all about him instead. He doesn't even say anything in the original scene. Baby speaks her mind and calls out his hypocrisy and everything he feels is shown through his reaction as he cries alone, realizing he made a mistake. It's a very powerful scene. Remake Dr. Houseman continues to dig in his heels and becomes very overprotective. I can't even look at him. He took the most precious thing in the world to me. Showing his very patriarchal view of his daughters as something he owns that another man can take away. Baby doesn't push back on this by saying that she's not his to own or anything else that would reflect her previously stated feminist beliefs, but instead talks about how she's so sad that her father will be all alone after the divorce. Poor guy. I'm going off to school soon. <laughs> and I don't really know what's going on with you and mom, but I'm really worried that when you finally stop working, and lift your eyes, nobody's gonna be there. Rather than it being about her finding herself and maturing into her own independent person, Baby's journey in this movie goes from worshipping her father to worshipping Johnny. The irony is, he's a lot like you, Dad. Next, we get a really awkward scene where Johnny pays back Dr. Houseman for the abortion and assures him that he won't mess with his daughter anymore. The acting is so wooden compared to the original. Both these actors look again, constipated. <laughs> and I do have to wonder where Johnny got this money from, because this does not happen in the original. The whole plot hinges on the fact that he and Penny are constantly hustling for jobs because they're living precariously, but he's just able to scrounge up hundreds of dollars in cash right after he was arrested? After Johnny is fired, despite being cleared of the theft charges, Baby says goodbye to him. It's another instance of two versions showing the same thing in broad strokes, but being absolutely opposite when you look at the details. In the original, their departure is bittersweet. They're clearly going to miss each other, but they part as friends, both having grown and learned from their relationship. I'll never be sorry. Neither will I. They don't have any regrets, and although things didn't end as they had hoped, it was a positive experience for the both of them. Contrast that with the remake, where Baby is a mess, crying and telling Johnny she'll always love him. I love you, Johnny, and I always will as he says nothing to her and then just rides away as an awful techno version of She's Like the Wind Plays. It's just sad to watch, and you don't get the feeling that this has been a rewarding experience for Baby, just that she fell hard for a bad boy who broke her heart. Then, Baby reminisces of her summer dancing experiences through a very boring, slow, and orange montage. Baby and Lisa talk about the feminine mystique again, now that Lisa has finished the book, and once again, the movie leans back into a choice feminism rhetoric that makes no sense for the situation or time period. Uh, I don't know anything, Lisa. I just read a lot and want to sound smart. You can't tell other people how to live their lives. Baby starts out the movie as a supposedly outspoken, independent feminist, critical of the institution of marriage and the restrictions it places on women. Then, falls in love with a man who treats her like crap and breaks her heart, and comes to the conclusion that she really shouldn't be criticizing her sister's choice to only care about finding a man to marry. So at this point in the original, after Baby and Lisa have a sweet bonding moment that shows maybe they're not so different after all, You're prettier your way. We go to the very last scene in the movie, about 15 minutes left total. In the remake, we get a whole extra 10 minutes for the parents to finally resolve their marriage issues. It's riveting. One conversation on a canoe and some boring sex is definitely gonna fix everything. Also, the daughters walk into their room and overhear the parents and then they're like, yay, that means no divorce. It's horrible. We get so much build up to this talent show when this movie has already been going on for ages. Every scene is so drawn out when most of the things these characters are talking about should already be resolved by this point. Baby gets a grown up dress from her mom, which honestly gives me First Communion vibes. There's more saying the themes out loud. You're not the same girl you were three weeks ago. And more reassuring us that it's okay that Baby had sex because it was true love, you guys. You didn't commit a crime. You fell in love. 
I do like Baby reading the bell jar during the talent show, but I'm not sure if they meant it to be funny. In fact, the whole talent show was played very straight. I always get emotional on the last night of the season. What can I say? I love you all. But it's a vacation talent show. It's supposed to be silly. There's literally a guy wearing goofy disguise glasses, and I'm supposed to take this seriously? Lisa and Marco show off their progress from their ukulele lessons that we never see. It's a pretty cute number. But we never did too much talking anyway. But don't think twice, it's all right. It does feel a little out of place for the 1960s, despite using a song from the time. The style is very, like, 2012 ukulele YouTube cover. We get an even more dragged out speech from Kellerman. My heart is full to bursting. This was a summer I'll always remember. That Johnny interrupts with one of the cringiest moments in the movie. Summer of friendship. A summer of, of love. His entire speech is peak cringe. I had the time of my life with you this summer. And he also has no reason to be here, since they never set up the plot with him choreographing the big dance finale. Why is Neil even letting him speak? He hates him. In fact, pretty much everyone but Penny and Baby dislike him. So this really doesn't have the same effect as it does in the original, when Johnny was popular and all the staff seemed pleasantly surprised to have him back. Again, this version is so fixated on Baby and Johnny being in love, when that was really not the point of this scene. This is supposed to be the part where Baby is truly seen and accepted by all as the woman she is, and Johnny stands up for himself against Kellerman. Somebody who's taught me that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Somebody who's taught me about the kind of person I want to be. Miss Frances Houseman. He introduces her to everyone as Frances Houseman, shutting the name baby and putting her child self behind. The sensual dance number they perform shows her maturity and confidence, and also how she's willing and unashamed to be with Johnny in front of everyone. The remake turns it into a big musical number that everyone joins in on. Not only is most of the singing besides Penny and Marco's very cringe and mediocre. We saw her riding on the wall as we felt this magical Choreography also sucks. This is one of the most famous scenes in any movie ever. Pretty much everyone on earth at least knows of the lift, and this is the kind of dancing we get instead. Everyone is cheering and ooing and aahing while they're doing this. The lift is also completely butchered. For some reason, the staff pick up Baby and just put her back down. Like, she's not on the stage anymore, so this makes no sense. And then they film the lift from the front instead of the side. So instead of getting the beautiful iconic silhouette of Johnny holding Baby up in the air, we're just stuck looking down Abigail Breslin's dress. Why would they film it like this? Dr. Houseman and apologizes to Johnny, and just when you think this is gonna wrap up, you're in for a treat. Yep, they make the parents sing. But that's not all, because in case you forgot, this movie has a framing device. So we're back to the 1970s, babysitting in the audience of Dirty Dancing the Musical. She goes to reunite with Johnny after the show, and we learn that the musical was inspired by a book she wrote, presumably about their summer together. The show was amazing, especially the choreography. It was inspired by your book. And she's also married with a kid. My mommy dances. Uh, not really. I take a salsa class once a week at the JCC. I really hate this. It very much seems like the writer saw La La Land and thought, yeah, let's do that without understanding why that movie worked. We didn't need to know about Baby's future. And the focus on the fact that she's married with a kid is sending a message that that's the focus of her life. Her book only gets one short little line. We never learn if she went to college. We can assume she didn't go to med school, but we know she's a mother and a wife now. And isn't that what's really important for a woman? Johnny also clearly still holds a torch for her more than 10 years later, and it's just sad. He's so obsessed with the summer fling that he made a whole musical about it, possibly to impress a married woman, not cute. The movie ends with an ugly freeze frame zoom and the modern cover of Be My Baby from the beginning. Boy, am I glad it's over. This movie was a goddamn mess. It butchered the storyline of the original, keeping enough of the broad plot points to stay recognizable, but changing enough details that the themes of coming of age and class differences were completely lost in a focus on a standard romance between a bad boy and a good girl. The feminist themes that were poignant but subtle in the original were completely undercut in a time where they're more relevant than ever. The added in element of the parents' marriage was so boring, it had me falling asleep, and the potentially interesting storyline given to Lisa was underexplored. The musical elements were inconsistent, not being able to decide between being a traditional musical or a movie where characters sometimes perform songs for a narrative purpose, and they added nothing to what was once a great and memorable movie. That, combined with bad acting and a complete lack of chemistry between the leads, made this movie unwatchably bad. It was seriously torture going through this, especially in comparison to the original, which was a nuanced story of Baby's journey to womanhood told through dance. I don't recommend it at all. Zero stars. If you're a fan of the original, stick with that one and don't torture yourself. And if you've never seen it, check it out. It's a great movie, unlike this two-hour-long cringe fest. I hope you enjoyed this 
video, make sure to like and subscribe and hit that notification bell. Let me know what you thought of the remake if you've seen it. Did you hate it just as much as I did? Are there any other movie musicals you want me to talk about? Thanks so much for watching. Bye!